Okay, I think we've gone live now. So um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. And my name is uh, Ian Bailey. I'm Professor of Environmental Politics at the University of Plymouth. And I'll be chairing this parallel session just to make sure people are in the session that they, they want to be in uh, this session and net zero policy, looking particularly at citywide and countywide approaches to achieving net zero. Um, we've got a couple of speakers this afternoon, Patrick Devine Wright from the University of Exeter and Paul Barnard from Plymouth City Council. But I'll, before we I do introductions um, to the first of our speakers, I'll just begin by reminding everybody uh, that there's a chat function on the right hand side of the screen there. So please feel free to put in any comments and any questions. And what we'll be doing today is we'll be taking all the questions after the two speakers. So uh, I'll be sweeping up um, the questions and taking a selection of them at least um, for uh, uh, a chat at the end of the two talks. So I'll begin with a very warm welcome to our first speaker, um, Professor Patrick Devine Wright. Um, Patrick is a professor of human geography at the University of Exeter. And uh, he's a very much an interdisciplinary social scientist on environmental issues. Uh, his research interests span human geography and environmental psychology, and really is a pioneer of research on how people's relationships with place and landscape influence attitudes to water and citing controversies over renewable and other forms of energy infrastructure. Patrick's also worked extensively on public participation and community engagement on climate and energy transitions and part of a more general uh, body of work, bringing the social sciences and making sure social science insights are uh, really front and center of discussions around low carbon uh, transitions. Uh, he's a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Working Group 3 on Mitigation, the sixth assessment report, and in particular, uh, a new chapter to the latest IPCC, a uh, very important one on demand services and the social aspects of mitigation. Um, he's also, um, and this speaks a little bit more directly to what Patrick will be talking about today, chair of the Devon Net Zero Climate Emergency Task Force, as well as being a non-executive director of uh, the Exeter Community Energy. And his talk is on um, the Devon Climate Assembly, a political response to the climate emergency. So thank you very much indeed, Patrick. Thank you, Ian, for that gracious introduction, and also to all of your colleagues for the invitation to speak here today at this conference. So yes, um, I will be talking about uh, the kind of local events and initiatives that have been going on in Devon over the last couple of years since the declaration of climate emergency. And in particular, I'm going to focus on some research that I'm doing with some colleagues across disciplinary boundaries uh, in geography and in politics. Uh, around the Citizens' Assembly, which has actually just begun this week and is, uh, we are conceptualizing it as a democratic innovation, um, which has, has not been done in Devon before. So our research has been looking at the, uh, the, the Citizens' Climate Assembly over time, and I'm going to be presenting some findings about that research to you today. So, well, actually, I've already been introduced, so I don't really need to say too much, actually. But uh, as Ian just described, uh, I've been very interested in uh, energy transitions and climate mitigation more generally for the last couple of decades. And in particular, I take an interest in uh, people's sense of place, place attachment, and how that pans out and influences community responses in the siting of big energy infrastructure like high voltage power lines, wind turbines, etc. And one of the insights that come out of that uh, extensive area of research now over the last two decades is about procedural justice concerns and the feeling that um, when controversy happens around the siting of these technologies, people consistently say that they've not had a chance to participate in decision making, their voices have not been heard. It's a kind of top-down implementation process. So I've been interested in participation and engagement for a very long time. And that spans into the project that I'm going to be talking to you about today. And as Ian mentioned, I'm able to um, be interested in these things at a, at a variety of scales. So I'm involved in the IPCC, as you mentioned. Um, also, I'm on various kind of expert panels at the national level in the UK and in Ireland. And most particular to this particular talk, I've been chairing the uh, task force, the Net Zero Task Force, which was set up in 2019 
when a climate emergency was declared by local organizations. And what that means is that I have a particular positionality in a sense around this. I'm not only here as an academic researcher, um, taking a look at what's going on, what's unfolding over time, trying to understand it, um, trying to make sense of it, but I'm also an active participant in these processes as the chair of the task force um, and also working closely with Devon County Council in particular and informing the design of the Citizens Assembly that we'll be talking about. So with my colleagues and Alice Mosley in particular, we've been writing some rapid evidence reviews so that uh, the local organizations running the Climate Assembly are coming from a position of being fully informed of the latest research evidence and therefore making sure that social science is brought to bear and is fully, fully understood and recognized by the decision makers in that local context. I've also really recently taken up a role actually as a, an advocate on climate change issues within the university because it's important that climate emergency just doesn't happen out there, but university researchers actually play a, a strong role in ensuring that their institutions reduce their carbon footprint because academics, as we know, quite like going to real conference, not just virtual conferences, but real conferences. And, and we work internationally, we work globally, we, we, we collaborate with people all over the world, and that generates environmental impacts of its own kind. So I'm interested in that too. But anyway, on to today's talk, which is about whether a new climate politics is at play. Um, a serious question, really, I think, given the seriousness with which um, the climate emergency is occurring and the need to act urgently in response to it. We've seen a whole host of social movement activity over the last couple of years and an emerging new narrative about that urgency with uh, the Fridays for Future strikes, declarations by a whole host of councils, national governments, institutions, businesses about it being a climate emergency. So what does a climate emergency actually mean? What does it mean? What do we do with that declaration? What's involved? And what we've seen is that many organizations have set targets. So we'll try and achieve net zero by 2030 or 2040 or 2050 or 2060. But how do you achieve the kinds of structural, the kinds of societal changes, institutional changes that will be absolutely prerequisite to achieving those goals? And that's where the interest in public deliberation comes in. It's about a new way of creating policy, of making policy. It's not at all a new idea. It's been around for a while, but it's only relatively recently, and particularly in the UK, that it's begun to be more widely used as a mechanism to bring citizens into the policymaking process. So there's two key research phases um, involved in the work that I'm doing with my colleagues at the University of Exeter. What I'll be talking about today is the beforehand stage, and this is research that was conducted last year in 2020. And this was investigating the kind of prior anticipations, motivations, aspirations. You know, what did people think that the Citizens Assembly would bring? What, what would it achieve? What was involved in it? Why did people want to have one in the first place? Because it is a kind of an experiment in a sense. It's never happened in Devon before. The institutions involved don't commonly use this mechanism at all. So what do they think it's going to bring? Will it be a catalyst for uh, significant change? So we asked all those kinds of questions. And we're staying in touch with it this year. Uh, the Citizens Assembly, as I mentioned, has actually just started online. The first session was last Wednesday, and it will be running over the next six or eight weeks. And across that period, I will be working with my colleagues to track progress over time, to speak to the participants, and we will be speaking to stakeholders as well, to ask some questions about what its impacts might be or have been, and what can be learned from it. Um, not only in terms of addressing the urgency of climate change, but also some of the other really difficult issues that are faced by decision makers and policy makers today. So why an interest in public deliberation? Why all the fuss about citizens' assemblies? Well, if you take a look at the broader policy context, there's undoubtedly been a decline of trust in formal representative politics. So in response to that, there is quite a lot of interest in whether you can recast the relationship between citizens and voters, members of the public and the politicians who are supposed to represent them. And lots of organizations, including Extinction Rebellion, have made persistent calls for a climate assembly to involve decisions at the heart of decision making. And that's in part because of a lack of trust that the politicians can actually do the job effectively and in the time scales the with the urgency required. A public deliberation has been used for other topics in the past, notably ones that tend to be controversial, uh, sensitive, difficult, awkward, um, and salient politically. 
notably, I think the successful treatment of abortion, uh, the abortion issue in Ireland with the Citizens Assembly that took place a few years ago and led to a referendum on that topic. It's also often used as a device when politicians want to seek legitimacy for making difficult decisions and being sure that they have a social mandate from the people in being prepared to do that and taking risk policy-wise. In terms of the research that we have in social science on public deliberation and citizens' assemblies in particular, there is a gap in relation to climate change around rurality. And that's where our work in Devon comes in. Most of the juries or assemblies that have taken place on the topic of climate change thus far have been held in cities, have been held in rural areas, or have been held at the national level. And there is a particular geography uh, to rural areas that makes the treatment of climate change quite challenging, as we'll talk about. There's also a gap in knowledge of perceptions of the value of public deliberation. A lot of the studies that have taken place so far have looked at their impacts afterwards or have looked at the participants and what happens to them, what do they learn, do they change their behavior, do they become more politically engaged. There's relatively less research on what people's expectations or aspirations beforehand of upcoming citizens' assemblies might involve. And as I said, we're very interested in the geographies of public deliberation like this. Devon has a particular characteristic. It's a fairly peripheral county, but it's also very large. It's got a very strong sense of place around designated landscapes like Dartmoor. Uh, and these are of international repute and significance. But it also has areas of acute deprivation and huge disparities between urban and rural areas. So all of that adds up to quite a complex geographical context within which to think about enacting public deliberation around climate. And there are lots of questions more generally about holding citizens' assemblies with what have been described as mini publics, a small number of people who are supposed to be representing that broader swathe of citizens in a population. How exactly are they representative? And do they stay representative when they become informed and go through the deliberative process? How accountable are they? Nobody voted for them, they've just been selected and recruited. And there may well be ongoing tensions between this more representative, uh, well, between this more participatory form of polix, politics and policy making and the representative si system of politics that it, it is taking place within. One of the key issues is what happens with the recommendations? Are they simply advisory and therefore could be ignored? Or will they be actually binding in some way so that policymakers must respond to them or even must carry them out? They can be resource intensive and expensive to conduct. And if online, like the one that's being held this, this week and over the next few weeks, it presents obvious logistical challenges around digital inclusion and exclusion. If you really want to reach a broad swathe representative of the population you're interested in across all the age groups and different parts of the county. So lots of challenges, but maybe opportunities as well. The thing to emphasize about the Devon Climate Assembly is that it's actually only one part of a much broader process, which was initiated by a coalition of local stakeholders two years ago, the Devon Climate Emergency Response Group. They initiated the Net Zero Task Force, which is a small group of experts that I'm the chair of. And collectively, we've held a number of initiatives already, which has led to the writing of an interim carbon plan late last year in the form of public consultations, calls for evidence, a youth parliament session, thematic hearings. All of that has taken place already. And the Citizens' Assembly was originally supposed to have taken place last year, but has been delayed due to COVID. And what that's meant is that it is not only taking place online with the challenges that go with that I just mentioned, but it's also become much more narrower in focus. So instead of deliberating on the carbon plan in its entirety, what the stakeholders have decided is to narrow down on three controversial and challenging issues. And they are about onshore wind energy. They're about uh, trying to encourage people to use their cars less. And it's also about retrofitting buildings to use less energy in the first place. And how do you make those three very challenging local issues work? So it's changed over time and it's part of one broader mechanism. And I think that's very important to consider when we think about its likely impacts and the, the stresses and strains that might be involved in the process. So the research I'm going to briefly talk to you about took place last year, as I said, using a mixed method approach, speaking to different kinds of stakeholders and engaged publics locally. 
And the key question we asked was, what are the motivations, aspirations, and expectations of the assembly held by these diverse individuals and groups? So I'll just give you a brief snapshot of the kinds of findings that have emerged from this qualitative research. Firstly, we'll talk about this kind of sense of experimentation or innovation in the way we do our politics in the democracy of climate. Well, firstly, it's, it's important to say that the, the assembly itself was seen in, in multiple contingent and overlapping ways by these different groups. Certainly, it was viewed front and center as a novel approach to policymaking different from business as usual, challenging the uh, normative position of politicians, and really trying to bring wider voices into the decision-making processes. And this is a recognition that even when consultations happen in the past, you tend to get the usual suspects in inverted commas weighing in. The whole point of having a citizens assembly, if it's representative, is that you're going to reach a large group of people, some of whom will not even normally vote in local or national elections. So these people's voices are not usually heard around the table when considering policy making and policy change. But the other thing that came across quite distinctly from stakeholders was that they were seeing the citizens assembly itself as a kind of instrumental tool for public education. So the focus is not just back on policy making institutions, but it's outwards into society, hopefully securing buy in for the hard choices that lie ahead. So the narrative underneath this theme was a, a, to some degree a skepticism that the public really are up for the challenges, the deep challenges and behavioral change required to meet net zero targets and hoping that the citizens assembly might be a trigger or a catalyst or a tipping point that would enable that kind of mass societal behavioral change to take place, even if being seen in quite an instrumental manner. Furthermore, there was quite a lot of recognition of the complexities of achieving net zero and the challenges involved in governing climate locally in the face of quite a centralized political system in the UK where many key decisions and frameworks are really taken not by local government or local stakeholders at all, but by London, by the UK government in the center. So moving on, another key point that came across was about the legitimacy of the assembly. If it's going ahead, how is it going to be legitimate? There were serious question marks about whether it would be fit for purpose. A lot of that was around representation. Who are the participants? Who are the witnesses? What kind of evidence is brought to bear? And where do the participants come from? Are they truly geographically representative of the county? So the rural sense of place that I mentioned earlier is very much important here. And also the fact that this citizens assembly is not happening in a kind of socio-historical vacuum. It's actually happening within a context of a county which has had long-standing tensions between urban areas and urban contexts of decision-making and rural areas and more peripheral areas where people might be more isolated and less uh, uh, easily involved in decision-making, policy-making processes. So this sense of equity and fairness, um, distinctions between the north and the south of the county, between the rural and the urban parts of the county. And you get that in the quote here, you know, that the, the concerns people have about an assembly that it could further disenfranchise uh, people from uh, decision makers, if it's not truly representative, it's just going to be the usual kind of urban focus, not in the north and not in the countryside. Also representing the views of young people who are the voices of the future and the less well off. So really trying to reach across groups and parts of society that don't often get a look in. And that was seen as vital to its legitimacy, without which people simply wouldn't give it credence and wouldn't respond appropriately as a result. And then the idea of risk and uncertainty about what its outcomes actually would be. Will it lead to the kind of significant structural and behavioral changes that many people are hoping and, and are, are certain that is needed at least? It was the view that the rural context of it taking place in actually makes it much more difficult to achieve these things. There's a whole swathe of issues, including farming and land use, transport infrastructures in rural areas where there's very few public transport options available, sensitivities around um, the siting of energy infrastructures. All of these are very difficult and, and uh, um, very, very difficult and challenging policy areas to grapple with. And it needs to reflect the varied experiences of communities across Devon's geographies. So in some, the risks and uncertainties were around the, uh, the radicality or not of the uh, conclusions and recommendations coming out of the assembly. 
there was some... just to, just about one one minute, if that's okay. okay. Right, I'm just finishing up. So, will they be too radical uh, and not achievable, or will they be not radical enough um, uh, to address the seriousness of the climate emergency? So, they were some of the risks associated with the uh, climate assembly. So, just to finish. It's perceived as an innovative form of democracy, but also something that brings considerable risks and uncertainties. Issues of legitimacy and representation central to its perceived utility and potential to inspire change. Um, so I think communication around the assembly is seen as vital, not only in order to ensure its legitimacy, but also to potentially achieve this transformational role that many people assume it might have going forward and achieving structural change across society. The next steps will be research on the citizens involved directly, as I've mentioned. And if you are interested to find out more about the research, there are various websites here for the project and also an open access journal article available, which you can use to find out more. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Patrick. Um, I'm learning as I go along to bring myself onto screen and I hope to unmute myself simultaneously. That's great. Really interesting uh, work that's going there in a very live environment. So, we'll, as I say, we've got some questions coming in, but we'll save those until we've had our second talk this afternoon. And it's a equally great pleasure to welcome Paul Barnard from Plymouth City Council. Paul has been a chartered town planner. Uh, for over 30 years and since 1991 with the uh, Plymouth City Council, where he's held a variety of planning policy, project management, senior management posts. And his current role is as um, the Plymouth City Council Service Director for Strategic Planning and Infrastructure. Among other things, Paul chairs the planning group of the Association of Directors of Environment, Planning and Transport, and is joint chair of the Plymouth Local Nature Partnership. Um, in 2019, Paul was awarded the RTPI, the, the Royal Town Planning Institute's gold medal, its highest award for his work on local authority planning and an MBE for his services to town planning in Plymouth. And Paul is currently responsible for coordinating Plymouth's response to climate change following the City Council's climate emergency declaration in March 2019. And amongst other things, he's driven the production of the first two out of 11 corporate carbon reduction plans and citywide climate emergency action plans, having established the Plymouth Net Zero Partnership in 2020. And Paul's talk is um, Plymouth Racing to Net Zero by 2030. So thank you very much and welcome, Paul. Thank you, Ian. And see that. Can everyone see that? Yeah, if you can just change it to the slideshow view, please, Paul. Uh. There might be a little delay. Hasn't done it so far. Can you try the icon towards the, the bottom right of the screen, just near the where it magnifies that you've got the, uh, the resolution, but also towards the bottom right hand side there. Uh, sorry, I can't see that. Well, where, you, where you've got the, towards the bottom right, where you've got the, where you can increase and decrease the size of the screen, I think it says 37% at the moment. And just to the left of that, uh, where it says the minus sign, you've got the icon for the, um, for the slideshow view. If that's not working, then I suggest what you just do is increase the magnification as much as possible. Okay, uh, just bear with me. All right, that's the one. How's that? 
still doesn't seem to be responding. Yeah, right. Don't know why. So maybe just, maybe just increase the magnification so that people can. I mean, we'll have to then also you know you'll have the kind of the normal toolbars and that sort of thing, but and then just scroll down a little bit so that see how that works for navigation. Is that okay? Ah, no, I know. I can only see what the problem is. You're in note view. Yeah. So if you go to yeah view in the top tool part, yeah, and then into normal. Okay, what we need to do is it, it, go back to the top toolbar again, Paul, where you see, and you can see where it says notes, and it's got that. If you click on that, it should take away the notes. Ah, right. Right now, now try the now try the slideshow view again. How's that? It's still not showing the slide view, so I suggest we just get ourselves underway and and try, try to navigate the, the slides as best as we can. Okay, well, hopefully people can see those. So thank you for the chance to, to talk. I'm going to go through the um, challenges that we're facing in Plymouth in relation to climate change. Those plans and some of the actions that we've taken to date. Um, no surprises here in terms of what the uh, main emitters are, buildings, transport, power generation and waste. And in terms of current emissions, um, they've fallen over recent years, currently standing at around 1 million uh, tonnes per annum uh, in Plymouth, um, with um, emissions by sector. Um, as you can see, some of those are um, uh, rising or flatlining, so still quite a lot to do. We've talked quite a lot in our work around policy, a policy gap. So business will result in increasing emissions. If we take the national and local policy objectives, that will get us to just over 50%. So there's a policy gap to uh, to address our uh, ambitions for net zero by 2030. Um, uh, or put it another way, we have to um, move three times faster than the government's previously stated objective of um, net zero by 2050. Obviously, percent reduction by 2035. In terms of our climate emergency response, we are one of 74% of councils that have declared a climate emergency uh, set to 2030. Uh, two action plans already produced and being implemented, and we have deliberately taken an action oriented approach to our uh, work on climate change. Uh, that's because the spatial strategy for the city is already set. Policy framework called the Plymouth Plan uh, has already been reviewed and updated to reflect those 2030 carbon am, uh, um, ambitions. Uh, clearly, uh, in light of the Climate Change Committee's reports and the uh, issues and commitments that the government will make on the back of COP26, no doubt that will have to be refreshed. Our climate emergency response as you can see them here, um, focused around um, establishing citywide conversations and taking action, but also creating some bottom-up pressure, not just from us as local communities uh, to government. But obviously, we can't deliver all of this on our own, but also set around a series of values about a citywide approach linking in with national and global initiatives, um, that everyone plays their part, but crucially, that no one is left behind, particularly vulnerable groups and communities. In relation to phase, the emergency response phase, um, that's very much about continuing some of our initiatives, inspiring local action, initiating lobbying with government and beginning a vision for what um, a zero carbon world in Plymouth would be about. The transition phase uh, is very much uh, where we are now, 2021 ramping up delivery of those projects on the most significant carbon reduction initiatives, um, looking at um, full scenario testing, identifying prioritised actions, embedding new ways of working and continuing that lobbying of government. And then, of course, the acceleration phase, which is crucial, um, whether you've set a target for 2030 or beyond, um, we all know that we need to, to embed those actions and start uh, that those key carbon initiatives are implemented and that indeed new projects um, are seen through that um, uh, lens of zero carbon by 2030. 
Uh, in terms of governance, we've established last year, as you said, a Plymouth Net Zero partnership, um, but also uh, reflecting the view that, um, that the, the cabinet of the council uh, has a lead uh, cabinet member for climate emergency, uh, recognising the place leadership role and democratic mandate of, of the local council. So that's very, very much been part of our thinking. But as you can see, our involved and informed uh, informing the work of the net zero partnership the climate action plans of which there are two one focused on the city council we were responsible as a city council in the delivery of services for one percent of emissions and then uh, wider uh, plymouth wide actions around uh, climate emergency so to give you a flavor the 2019 corporate carbon reduction plan had 39 actions in it and uh, invested 1.88 million. The 2021 plan that we're in the process of delivering now has 24 actions and has, has identified investment of 4.78 million. In terms of the climate emergency action plan for the city as a whole, the 2019 version of that had 75 actions of which we delivered 71 and invested 5.68 million uh, in carbon reduction initiatives. And the 2021 uh, climate Emergency Action Plan as 89 action, 38.2 million this year in decarbonising uh, activity within the city. Um, given the analysis that I touched upon earlier, clearly um, uh, we're focusing on the major emissions, so it won't be any surprise that the key areas of, of focus are engagement, responsibility, behavioural change, as well as buildings, power and heat, mobility and waste. Uh, and the details of all of this are on the City Council's website. Um, in terms of our corporate carbon reduction plan, similarly, uh, our actions are focused around the, um, the largest uh, emitters um, in relation to our activities. So just a few examples to finish off. We've secured 3.3 million um, of Green Homes grant to invest in energy efficiency improvements um, focused on low, low uh, income households, addressing fuel poverty issues in the city and undertaken um, a number of improvements across buildings uh, within the city, notwithstanding the impact of the pandemic last year. In relation to uh, low carbon housing, we've been delivering already since 2013 under our Plan for Homes program, passive house and low carbon proje uh, housing projects with our partners, Plymouth Community Homes and Plymouth Energy Community. Um, but we're now in the process of developing an eco homes program, which for the first time in 40 years, we'll see the city council actually taking a lead on the delivery of low carbon housing itself. And we hope that that program will deliver uh, in the region of 250 low carbon and zero carbon homes in the coming years. Um, our joint local plan um, requires all new development to uh, connect to existing or planned future district uh, heating networks. And indeed, um, the work uh, has already been completed on the Mill Bay Boulevard, which has included the installation of district energy heat pumps um, to allow new developments, commercial and housing developments to plug into those as they come forward in the Mill Bay area. In relation to uh, travel, uh, 4.7 kilometres of off-road cycling routes are in the process of being delivered this year uh, in the northern and eastern corridors of the city. Our EV charge points programme is delivering 504 EV charge points in the next three years. Uh, and uh, our investment in our uh, traffic light signals program is reducing energy consumption from traffic lights and lighting of subways by 50%. We're also continuing our promotion for walking and cycling um, with local schools and um, businesses. We have uh, installed three electric char ferry charge points and launched the first um, commercial electric ferry uh, service, the first um, city in the country to do so. Uh, in terms of our own fleet replacement program as a city council, uh, we're investing 1.4 million um, uh, to purchase 54 electric vehicles, covering every aspect of the council's services um, and obviously looking at uh, how we can uh, further electrify the fleet in the long term. We're investing 9.7 million um, in the development of 50 multimodal hubs across the city, uh, including 300 public electric charge points, 400 electric bike facilities, and the establishment of electric car clubs uh, in various locations around the city. And we're shortly to go out to tender on that.
And of course, linked to the behavioral change initiatives, there's a whole range of uh, projects and awareness raising campaigns which have been the subject of some other um, talks uh, during the conference um, so I won't dwell on them but uh, they're very much part of our of our program and just to finish off um, we're working uh, with the Plymouth Tree Challenge um, which is all about re rewilding um, uh, parts of the city with new tree planting and promoting the value of trees and of course recently Plymouth has been identified as a new community forest which will see a major expansion of Okay, we seem to have lost Paul as frozen there on the screen. Can you still, I wonder whether Paul can still hear us at the moment, not getting anything back at this, this point in time. Looking to see whether Paul is going to come back. Technology is wonderful until you try to work it. I'll bring myself back on screen for now because um, we don't seem to have a a link with Paul at the moment. Um, Patrick, maybe you'd like to bring yourself back onto screen as well. If that's okay. Um, thank you. For that. Well, Paul, there seems to be a, a blank space which which might may or may not be you. We can't hear you at the moment, but. Um, um, in lieu of that, just to say thank you very much indeed um, uh, for for your talk and, and for telling us, you know, giving us a whistle stop tour of the various range of initiatives that um, Plymouth City Council has undertaken in, in a really short period of time. Um, and just work, I think I'm probably going to have to work on the basis that just just you and I here at the moment, Patrick, to to ask um, kind of some some questions around this. Yeah, um, yeah we've got some to with yeah. We've got some got some questions that have uh, um, Paul may Paul sorry um Here we lost con we lost contact with you for a period of time. That's okay. Uh, Are you okay. here now? Okay, yeah, we, we're up and we're up and running, and I think we've probably moved it because we've only got about five minutes left now into the the question um, phase of of the session, and um, and we've got a few questions come up. One one of which uh, well, there's a couple of questions that seem to be gravitating around a, a, a kind of a cognate type of issue which is around you know how to get citizen representation actually heard by government and acted on by government um so i just yeah as opposed to just it being watered down or or, or getting buried somewhere so i wonder if one or both of you would like to comment on, on that yeah I, i'll maybe start i mean i think it's a really good question to ask because in a sense um the the citizens assemblies are taking place in a system that is that where the representative polit politicians make all the decisions so will it lead to any change i think it's definitely the right question to ask and that's why extinction rebellion for example didn't just want a citizens assembly but they want a citizens assembly that had teeth in a sense that the recommendations would become law so they wanted a very strong legally binding kind of regulatory assembly and maybe for unsurprising reasons, representative politicians have never seemed that enthusiastic about that kind of weight being given to a citizen's assembly. So you're right, they tend to be advisory, they tend to give recommendations. And the Devon Climate Assembly that I discussed is no different from that. It is not making law, but it is making recommendations that local councils and other stakeholders must listen to. My hope, I guess, is that the amount of political capital that's been invested in the process so far would make it almost untenable for them to turn around and completely ignore the recommendations of the assembly once it's finished. That's what I think might happen. But you know, strange things happen in politician in politics, and and, and you're absolutely right in this sense that that there there maybe could and should be some skepticism about, about whether the recommendations will be seen through. That's why I think the citizens' assembly has to be seen in that broader context. It clearly evolved from politicians seeing Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for the Future advocating structural change and if, if if those groups stay quiet and just let it all happen then who knows whether anything will happen at all but if there still remains pressure from society if policymakers know that they're under scrutiny 
then maybe the recommendations are more likely to be taken up. Only time will tell. And Paul, you, you also talked about um, conversations taking place within Plymouth City Council before uh, and then actions sort of happening very rapidly. I mean, what was the relationship and you know, who were those conversations with and what was kind of the relationship between conversation and action there? Because there seems to be a lot of actions following on from conversations. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we looked at the options around citizens' assembly, but there was a very strong political view um, uh, of the previous administration in Plymouth, because it's changed in the uh, intervening um, few months, um, that, um, that, that there was a democratic mandate and a democratic leadership for politicians um, and that uh, they very much wanted to focus on actions rather than strategizing. I suspect a lot of people who want to see actions in the in this field have got frustrated by continual consultations and continual strategizing. Having said that, clearly there was a crucial role to engage in what we call climate change conversations. And we did that uh, uh, in, a, in as wide a set of forums, the youth parliament, um, pre-existing community uh, groups uh, and uh, various other forums to try and uh, engage um, to inform those action plans that, that I spoke about. So that was a deliberate choice based around a view about democratic leadership, a different model uh, clearly to uh, that that's being pursued in Devon, although I have to say, of course, Plymouth citizens are involved in uh, in the Devon uh, Climate um, uh, Assembly. So it'll be interesting to see what the interrelationship between those two approaches will be. Mm. I, I think there's something in there. Just uh, and I, I, If it's all right, I'm going to indulge for an extra few minutes and take one more question after this. But just a, a, a brief comment is that, that maybe it reflects some of the things you were saying, Patrick, about the, the geographies. Of the two regions, and that you know, Plymouth, in some respects, and not over stylizing, being a relatively cohesive and individual city with a lot of networks established, and, and Devon, of course, being this this diverse, large, um, yes. yeah, and varied place. The yes. second question I wanted to kind of bring out, though, because it, it was asked in relation to Plymouth, um, but it, I think it has a broader applicability here, which is along the lines of, uh, uh, and you can do the translation work here, Patrick. I'm sure you're very capable. Where I live, not Plymouth, there are many new houses going up, none with heat pumps or solar panels. How can councils enforce zero carbon policies when central government is relaxing regulations and reducing power of local people? So it's that kind of re relationship between central local actions and, and central government. And, uh, if you'd care to offer any comment on that, that's I'll let Paul take the floor first, I think. Okay, well, I mean, we're, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, we're uh, we're in the most centralised state in Europe in relation to how planning operates. So that's the first point. The second point is the word used was enforced, to which the answer is it can't be enforced because, because of that central control. Nevertheless, lots of councils have done some very, very innovative things using their local policy to seek to secure innovations in delivery. And I touched upon of those in in what I referred to so it can be done through negotiation and through direct delivery by councils but it can't be enforced unless the um, national planning policy framework is changed to reflect the stated ambitions of the UK government they are out of sync and of course people may or may not be aware of the planning reforms uh, there was a reference to uh, local democracy um, uh, it's an interesting point as to whether um, those reforms will um, secure uh, sorts of carbon initiatives that we know we need to deliver as a society. Thank you. A any closing thoughts, Patrick, on the central local relationship? Well, it, clearly local areas are to some degree hamstrung, as Paul described there. Um, and I do think that it would be interesting to see whether the Devon Climate Assembly citizen participants actually end up setting recommendations which are at least uh, the same to an audience for national government for change as much as to local stakeholders advocating change. So I think they'll be quite mindful of these constraints. And so I, it would not surprise me at all if some of the outcoming recommendations were actually tailored to national government to make these kind of changes as much as facing local stakeholders that need to get on and do stuff. And it's to release those barriers and those structural uh, impediments that are, are, as the question pointed out, um, still allowing homes to be built that are connected to gas etc which is just mm. crazy you know yeah. be, yeah. new new types of politics new ways of governing mm. okay i think we're probably going to have to leave it at that and uh, apologies to everybody 
um, that the technology did, wasn't quite seamless for us this afternoon, but I think we managed to work our way through it. And uh, again, a really big thank you to Patrick uh, and to Paul uh, for your co really interesting contributions this afternoon and for everybody joining the session and for Naomi also for hosting it. Thank you very much, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.